So we're going to be reading out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, if you grabbed a Bible from the back, if you have the ESV, that's going to be page 1175. If you have an NIV, it's going to be page 1843. And again, that's going to be 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'll start at verse 12. And we'll go through, or I'll start at verse 1, and we'll go through verse 12. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Morning, Water Dam. It's good to be with all of you. I uh, appreciate all of you being here and hearing uh, Mallory and having the Keenans here. We've uh, been blessed by them. They used to sit right there. I used to know where they were at all the time. Now they're moving around on me a little bit. Mallory, it's her fault. <laughs> Threw you under the bus. Uh, we're glad you, you came and talked to us, and we're glad that you uh, have served so faithfully for two years in Zambia. Um, we, we have been blessed... Uh, to uh, be a part of your life, and so we hope that you've been blessed by us as well. We'll continue to pray for you as you settle in to your new life back in the States, and uh, we're, so we're glad of all that. Um, I would just ask you to pray for uh, Jeremy Tribuco's father, Scott Dilley, D-I-L-L-E. He fell and broke two vertebrae in his neck. There's no paralysis, and he's in AGH, I believe that was correct. And uh, just to pray for him, he just had knee surgery, he was recovering, he ended up in ICU there, and now he fell and has two broken uh, bones in his neck. So please pray for Scott Dill Dilly, Jeremy uh, Tribuco's father, and uh, let's go to the Lord. Father God, we thank you for today. <clears throat> as you come to us, we're so encouraged by your ministry that we have as a body of Christ, Lord, you tell us to rest in you, to rest in the hope of Christ as we face affliction. Um, we know that we ask for your help for those that are going through affliction right now. We thank you for the doctors that uh, you have given to provide care for Scott and uh, pray for Jeremy as he goes back and forth to the hospital and for strength, just got his wife home. Pray for Casey as well. We lift up also, the Stewart family, as uh, we have been blessed to have Jack for so long in our church, um, we thank you, Lord, for his ministry, he and Judy, and their care for this place and their care for others. We ask that you would just be with them. We thank you for everyone that helped Jack um, take care of his, his house and just different things that he needed help with. We thank you, Lord, for all those people that, that got to know Jack through that ministry. We pray for your help for their family as they grieve the loss of Jack. We do lift up all of those who have faced this loss of loved ones as we have had several in our church. We ask thank you for the hope of eternal life for it is the only thing that makes a difference in the facets of life that we face. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're continuing on in our uh, scripture um, 
today. Uh, the series is called Living in the Light and uh, in the Face of Affliction. And then today we are talking about the lawlessness that is going, the man of lawlessness, I should say, that is coming about in chapter 2. Um, as we think about it, um, this is, again, one of the earliest letters that Paul reacted. He wrote the first letter. Um, it's less than 20 years after the death of Christ. And now he's written the second letter, maybe less than a year um, from that one. And so he's concerned about something. Don Carson talked about this book of Thessalonians. D.A. Carson, is, as he is known, and he defined these three chapters in this way. He said chapter 1 is about living in difficult times. And then chapter 2 is called waiting for the end times. And then you get to chapter 3, and it says working in the meantime. Now, the reason why he says that, because the people had stopped working. They thought they were in the end times. And so they said, Christ is coming back. We'll just quit our jobs, and, and he's going to be here. We're not, it's not going to matter anyway. We're not even going to need our car to get back home if Christ came back today. That would be a powerful sermon on the rapture, wouldn't it, if I, if I said that today? Yeah, we're going to be raptured, and we wouldn't have to drive home. But today we're talking about living in the light of the gospel as we wait on the end times. We will see whether we live in difficult times or whether we're waiting for the end times. You and I are working in the meantime. Our hope is in the coming of the Son from heaven, as theirs was. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, that they were waiting for the Son of Man to come from heaven and that he would deliver us from the wrath to come. They didn't expect to face the wrath. That was the mindset. You can go back and read it in chapter 1, verse 10, of the first book, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Now, the stage seems to be set for in our day, even now, for the return of the king, right? Uh, we think that the end times is now, as everybody does. I tell that to, to Melissa sometimes. I said, I don't know, Melissa. I think this is the end times. She goes, Paul said that a long time ago, Jack. <laughs> Just get over it. Relax. But it does feel like it, the stage has been set because of as the church has faced that for a number of years. So, so many Christians over the years have felt like they were living in the last days. And so, <laughs> I am one of them. The people of God, here's why Paul writes this letter. The people of God were unsettled by that idea because somebody had written a letter. If you look in your Bible in 2 Thessalonians 2.2, so I have to get the chapter in the book right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, not to be, he tells them not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming, the word seeming, to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come, already come, basically. They, 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 the people where there was a letter or somebody said something, it's, or people were repeating it, it's probably a letter that's gotten filtered, and then people are, of course, repeating it and saying the day of the Lord has already come. We're, 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 we're without hope. And Paul is addressing, this is why he gets this letter out to them, and he wants to talk to them. You know, the thing about false teaching that is so dangerous about it, when people teach falsely things about God, is that people believe it. That's the danger. That's simply the danger of false teaching. People believe it sometimes when they hear it, especially if someone says it with enough conviction and enough kind of evidence that Satan's a good counterfeit. I mean... He told the people back in the garden, he said, uh, you're not going to die. After all, God's holding back something from you. Remember, that's the lie in the garden. And, uh, it, and they fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. So false teaching is dangerous. We are going to look today at this passage. But I want to review a little bit and take a phrase from the first passage. He says in there, in the King James Version, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, and you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, Dan, Pastor Dan went back through that last week, as you know, that he talked about affliction, that the people were having difficulty and affliction and a lot of bad things going on. But he says, basically, notice he says, Jesus is going to be revealed, basically, from heaven. The whole world will know when Jesus returns. He says he will return with his mighty angels. That's a big deal, Right? So when you see God coming, you're going to see him coming with his mighty angels. You're not going to miss that. 
and he's going to be coming in flame and fly, fire. I almost got it mixed up there. Um, but flaming fire, that God's going to come with flaming fire. Now, what does that mean? You know, it could be judgment. Fire is used for judgment in the Bible. But there's also it's a Shekinah glory, that God's going to come back in glory. And he's going to come visibly, physically, and gloriously. That's Dan, you heard that last week? That is basically what we say about the return of Christ, that when we talk about glorious return, we're talking about that God's going to come back in this visible way. And you remember from Paul's first letter, he tells them that they were waiting. What? They were waiting for Jesus to deliver them from the wrath to come. And they were facing affliction. But he's talking about in this passage that that God's going to come and you're not going to miss it. But he's talking about the day of the final coming of Christ, the tribulation, the time when God comes back and judges the world. Paul in chapter 2 says, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, he says, now concerning, now concerning, basically, the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered together to him. Now, some people believe that's the rapture, and that's what he was talking about, referring back to what he said in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, when he talked about the, the church being caught up. And the reason why, and, and, and I and I. I, I believe there is some indication of that is because of what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that the church would be caught up. And they said, hey, we've been, we're waiting on Christ. He's supposed to deliver us from the wrath to come. You see, that's, that's where my mind goes when I hear this. Now, you know, some of you don't, don't believe that. That's okay. I don't want to fight. I just wanted you to know that that's in there. And that's what, you know, okay. So we'll all be glad when Jesus returns, and I'm happy to adjust my view, but I think I, I, think I'm, I, think I got a good view, uh, and I know that you do too. You've got a good view, but we'll all be glad when Jesus... We're, on the, we're not on the planning committee. We're on the welcoming committee, okay? So put your knife down or whatever you got and uh, relax. Now, people were shaken up. Notice it says they were shaken up in their mind. They're alarmed. They're basically troubled by that in second list in this chapter 2 that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered together him we ask you brothers he says not to be quickly shaken in your mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come so he says don't get all shook up about this I, you know, don't let yourself get all worried about it. You know, be aware of it. When people start talking about the end times, they talk about, you know, some people say that they're a prophet. Jesus said there's going to be all kinds of people claiming to be Christ. There's going to be all kinds of people. I heard a pastor talking about this passage. He said all kinds of people come to their church and say claiming they're, they're some prophet. They claim to be Isaiah. They claim to be Ezekiel. One guy claimed to be Moses. He said they got all people, all, all these people coming to their church. And he told, he, told, uh, he told the guy that said he claimed to be Moses a prophet. He goes, well, we're a nonprofit organization. <laughs> I like that. So I'm, I'm going to use that if someone claims and stands up and says they're Moses or whatever. But there, there's all kinds of things going on here. He says, you who are troubled, rest. And then he's talking about, in the chapter 2, he says, talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there's a time coming that we're going to be gathered to him. And that's what the, was the focus of their mind. That they're, think, they're thinking 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. I, I believe that. I believe that they, they're ta- they think they're going to be caught up before the, the tribulation. And they're saying, hey, it's getting bad here. It's getting bad here, Paul. <laughs> you know, and I'm not happy about it. I don't know about you. I don't like going through stuff. You know what I mean by stuff? I went through some stuff with the grandkids the other day at the Dippin' Dots station. <laughs> I bought two little cups of Dippin' Dots and a regular, a medium for me. Melissa didn't want any. I knew she'd try to eat some of mine, though. <laughs> the girl said, it said, do you want to leave a tip? And I'm thinking, oh, it's, these kids are needing money. I'll leave a tip. I, I put 20% down. I, think, I thought, how much could it be? 32 bucks. <laughs> Anyways, I'll have to get over it. I don't know what. <laughs> I'm still 
trying to figure that out. What are these little balls of stuff that they do melt, you know? <laughs> Dippin' dots. We're, out, we're in the end times. I know it. Inflation. I won't say what I was thinking. <laughs> we're in a political season. I don't want to say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> you are troubled. Rest. You are troubled. Rest. Rest. You know, like, it's, it's saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus talked about the rapture. Well, some of us believe that Jesus talked about the rapture, the coming again for the church. In John chapter 14, he says, I go away to prepare a place for you. If I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. And so this is, you know, you have to be careful. Let me just say this, that we don't, we got to be careful when we harmonize the Gospels, when we harmonize Scripture with other Scripture. We have to be very careful with that. And, and people do it on both sides of this argument. So, so that's a key phrase in se- in the, this chapter 2, are being gathered together to him. That's what they're unsettled about. He says, you who are troubled, rest. Don't be alarmed. Don't get all shook up. And so he says, don't, don't let yourself get worried about it. The coming of the Lord is the blessed hope of the church. Who's coming? In this coming, it will be Christ. He will be revealed. When he's revealed, in this instant, Jesus will be uncovered. The apocalypso the unveiling of Christ. Remember that when he came, the first time he came, he came as a baby. And the first time he came, you would not have known who he was. There was only a few people that actually realized who he was. He came from the womb of a woman. When he came the first time, he was born of a virgin, and people spit upon him. He walked in the dust of the ground. He walked among us. You would not have known who he was. There was nothing that says in Isaiah to draw us to him. That's a really fascinating statement. And so he came the first time, he was veiled. But when he comes again, you're going to see him as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And Dan talked about this in verse 10 there of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. When he comes on that day, he will be glorified with all the saints to be marveled at. So there's no joke here. There's no, no doubt this is Christ coming back. And he's saying that's the way the day of the Lord's going to go down. You, you would have known it, he's saying. You would have known it by now. And so he says, are you troubled? Paul says, rest. Rest with us, he says, in this truth that, that Christ is going to be coming back and you'll know it and you won't miss it. You'll either be caught up in the rapture or, or you'll, you'll, you'll meet the Lord in the air, right? But Christ is going to come back and it says, I'm going to call the church up. And they'll meet me in the air. And those who were already died, those who were fell asleep already, will return to meet you there. Now, people go into all kinds of arguments. You guys can go read those on your own. But the one thing, I was at a funeral um, uh, this past week, and, and I said something. I said, this is, this, is, this is all that matters. Every facet of life, the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected, that he, this is a glorious truth that we can have eternal life. And he says, our hope is in the coming of this king who is going to be the Lord of lords. And when he's coming, when is Jesus coming? We don't know the hour. No one does. No one knows the hour. The second coming of Jesus is talked about, uh, according to Adrian Rogers, in the book of Malachi 4.2. And I want you to share, share with you what he said. He said, Jesus is coming as the son of righteousness. If you read Malachi 4. Two, that's what it says. But you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. The word for son is not S-O-N, but S-U-N in that passage. It's an analogy. And the writer of Malachi says the second coming of Jesus is like the sunrise, like the sunrise when the sun comes up. Now think about the sunrise. Point number one about the sunrise is you can't hurry it. Can you make the sun come up faster? No, you can't. Point number two is you cannot stop it. Now think about that. The sunrise, 
You cannot hurry it. You cannot stop it. Those who believe can, they can, in Christ, in his second coming, he, you can know that he is coming. You don't know. You can't hurry it up, but you can't stop it. And those who believe can have great hope in this. We can rest in this hope. And so when someone dies, like Jack Stewart, I remember Jack. Oh, my gosh, I came here. He used to go outside and help Judy. She had him working hard. He had to put on his hat. They'd come in and get a drink of water or bring in their own Diet Coke or whatever. I don't know what they drank. But they used to come in. But the, I got to Jack, know Jack and Judy, and Jack was just... He was, Judy would, Judy had him working and, and stuff. And she was an ex-nurse, but she was our nurse, our resident nurse. And she would get on to Jack and tell him stuff that he needed to be doing. And when Jack, when he lost Judy, 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 he kept her Bible and he carried her Bible. And he would tell me every time I preached, if I preached on something she had underlined. He said, Judy has that underlined, Jack. And he said, I, you know, I think he took great comfort in that. It was almost like she was talking to him. We have great hope in the Lord. And our faith cannot be through somebody else's faith. But we can encourage people in the faith, as Mallory talked about. Now, I'm going to do something I never do. I'm going to end early. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop here on point number one. <laughs> you are troubled. Rest. We just need to rest in Christ. Let, let no one, let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. Because look at what it says here. If you, if you look at that first chapter, he talks about people that will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of the Lord. His might, when he comes on that day to be glorified in the saints and be marveled at among all who believe, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray to make you worthy of his calling and may you fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith. So resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the garden of our minds right now, if we're going through stuff, because when we go through stuff, I, I think that it's important for us to think about that God's coming. And like the sun, you can't hurry it. The sunrise, you can't hurry it, and you can't stop it. And life's just going to continue on. But what does he say at the end there? We're going to pray that you basically establish yourself in the work of God and trust in his power to go on. So I don't know where you're at and what you're going through, but like one of the things that the Bible talks about is the seeds are thrown onto the ground of, of the four soils. And sometimes when we go through things, we get distracted, we get disgruntled, and we're tempted to fall away from the faith. And that's what we'll talk about next week when we talk about falling away from the faith. You who are troubled, rest. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. Some of us are troubled here today, Lord. Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Paul says, you who are troubled, rest. Lord, as we think about what you said in 2 Timothy, that Paul said these familiar words, that he laid up for me a crown of righteousness for the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day, not only to me, but to also to all who love his appearing. Lord, we love your appearing. And Father, we pray, come Lord Jesus, as Dan prayed, preached last week. Come Lord Jesus, come. In other words, hurry. We don't know the hour, but we know you're coming. And so, Father, I pray for those that are out here that don't have their belief. They don't believe. Help them to believe. Help their unbelief. Help them to throw their, 
their body, their, their whole soul before you, Lord, and ask you to forgive them of your sins. Because you've given me the hope in the gospel that whomsoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will find rest for their soul. They will be saved. For those who believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and was raised from the dead, it's all that matters, friends. There's nothing else that matters so much that this truth is in you and that you've received it as one of his children. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. The people who have put their faith in him. The people that have put their faith where God put their sin, which is their faith is in Jesus. And Christ wants to take your sin from you. He died on the cross to receive our punishment and to provide for our resurrection, our forgiveness and redemption. We ask you, Lord, you help us as we think about these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the words of the benediction from Jude chapter 1, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless you.